A hero to some. A monster to others. He hoped to start a third world war. The CIA and American special forces conspired to bring him down. His death is shrouded in mystery, his body secretly buried in an unmarked grave. But the man they hoped the world would forget is the man who would become a legend. He's a man lionized by youth and revolutionaries around the world. The face on millions of t-shirts. But the real Che Guevara was not a two-dimensional image, but a complex man with an unwavering goal. Che described being a guerrilla as the highest form of humankind. Someone who was prepared to sacrifice himself for an ideal, in his case, and it was for the cause of Marxism-Leninism, the solution to mankind's ills, and the only way to turn around the world order from one dominated by Yankee capitalism. In author John Lee Anderson's best-selling biography, Che Guevara, A Revolutionary Life, he explores the man behind the myth. First and foremost, I wanted to know what had led this well-born son of an affluent old Argentine family, a son of the middle class, with everything going for him, to leave that comfortable existence and become the most implacable, well-known revolutionary of his day. May 14, 1928. Che Guevara is born Ernesto Guevara de la Serna in the city of Rosario, Argentina. Ernesto Guevara Lynch was Che's father. Celia was from an illustrious Spanish family. They were considered to be of the upper class. Carlos Figueroa is a childhood friend of Ernesto's. Ernesto didn't discriminate. He would hang out with all the kids, whether they were children of privilege or the children of servants. The eldest of four children, Ernesto is afflicted with chronic asthma, a condition that haunts him throughout his life. The family moves to the hill town of Alta Gracia, hoping the drier climate will help their sick son. In Alta Gracia, Ernesto meets Calica Ferrer. The boys and girls would gather around to dance, but Ernesto was a really bad dancer. He had a bad ear. We'd be playing one style of music and he'd be dancing to another. The adolescent Ernesto was known for being hypersexual. His first experience was with the family maid. He would try to seduce any woman of any shape, age or appearance. One of Ernesto's more unusual traits is his lack of hygiene, which earns him the nickname Chancho, meaning pig in Spanish. He had a shirt called the Weekly Shirt because he would only change it once a week. We called him Chancho, and it stuck with him ever since. But he didn't mind. He kind of liked it. Yet for all Ernesto's wild antics, he possesses a very introspective side. He was always searching um, for a kind of the meaning for life. He was more advanced than his peers. He read serious authors. Nehru and Gandhi and Steinbeck and Faulkner and Mussolini. He was a voracious reader. Though he enrolls in medical school, Ernesto's true education comes from the trips he takes through undeveloped Latin America. Alberto Granado was an older student. He proposed that the two take off for a journey by motorbike the length of Latin America. It was a quest to look beyond the privileged confines that were his birthright. Putting his medical degree on hold, Ernesto and Alberto head out on an old Norton motorbike nicknamed La Ponderosa II, 
on January 4, 1952. All we could see was the dust on the road ahead and ourselves on the bike, devouring kilometers in our flight northward. They traveled down to Patagonia and across to Chile, where La Poderosa finally gave out. Ditching the bike, they travel on foot and hitch rides on the back of trucks, heading for the interior of Chile. They traveled up to see the world's greatest open pit copper mine, Chuquicamata, which loomed large in the imaginations of Latin Americans in the time because it was U.S. owned and run. It was this notion of the kind of monstrous capitalist enterprise uh, exploiting the local workers. American companies like Anaconda and Kencock monopolized Chile's mining industry. American companies went to Latin America for two reasons. Cheap raw materials and cheap wages. To a young nationalist and a young idealist of the early 1950s, it would be very hard to look upon U.S. policies as practiced in Latin America kindly. He saw something he hadn't seen before. He saw the face of poverty. In America, Ernesto, being who he was, was terribly bothered by what he had seen. From Chile, Ernesto and Alberto head to Peru and then continue on to Venezuela. After seven months on the road, Alberto decides to stay in Venezuela, while Ernesto returns home to Buenos Aires to complete his last year at medical school with a new social conscience. All this wandering around, or America with a capital A, has changed me more than I thought. When he finished medical school, he said, See, you thought I couldn't do it, but I graduated. So pack your bags, because we're going to be leaving soon. Ernesto and Calica head for Bolivia. Along the way, they meet other young travelers. They were students. They had invited us to see Guatemala. Ernesto is intrigued by the students' political fervor and the situation in Guatemala, where President Jacobo Arbenz is attempting to bring about a social revolution through land reform. Arbenz was intent on nationalizing the unused land of the major uh, U.S. banana uh, and fruit companies, particularly United Fruit. Uh, of course, United Fruit was a company that had very close ties to the Eisenhower uh, administration. The Secretary of State John Foster Dulles had been on the board of United Fruit. John Foster Dulles was the brother of Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA. United Fruit paid a, a very skilled public relations specialist to kind of whip up a frenzy about the uh, threat of communism in this small, impoverished country of Guatemala. December 24, 1953. It is amid this charged atmosphere that Ernesto first arrives in Guatemala. Soon he is introduced to a Peruvian woman named Hilda Gadea. Hilda immediately became besotted with him. She had even went to the point where she pawned some jewelry in order to keep him in his hostels. And eventually they began sleeping together. Hilda introduces Ernesto to followers of a 26-year-old Cuban lawyer named Fidel Castro. He had led an attack on the Moncada military barracks, the second largest military garrison in Cuba, in an audacious attempt to overthrow Cuba's president, General Fulgencio Batista. Many of the people that attacked the barracks, a lot of whom were students, former students, workers, organizers, a lot of them were killed, tortured, killed. Uh, the ones that survived, including Fidel Castro and his brother, were sentenced to prison. Castro was serving a 15-year sentence, but Ernesto was deeply impressed with his men. Unlike his Cuban friends, Ernesto was not committed to any cause or ideology, but the ouster of Guatemala's president, Arbenz, changes his view. The first CIA-sponsored coup in Latin America took place in, in Guatemala in 1954. And essentially the army got scared and told Arbenz that he had to resign, and, and, and he did. Castillo Armas is placed in power on June 27, 1954. He's seen by many as an American puppet. He begins arresting suspected communists and anyone connected to the old... 